Welcome back to the second part of the RSET training, selecting climate change projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. My name is Brock Blevins, training coordinator for NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. This training series will provide an overview of resources for choosing climate projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk. After participating in this training, attendees will be able to understand the differing needs of mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications, recognize the main components and distinguishing factors of climate projection sets, summarize the benefits and trade-offs of different climate projection sets and versions, and discuss, this, and discuss selection of the best climate projection sets for various application needs. In part one yesterday, we discussed key distinguishing features of climate projection sets where they come from, in the context of application areas, such as mitigation, adaptation, and risk. Today, in part two, we'll be discussing the different considerations in choosing a projection set for a given application. So once again, I will hand this off to Dr. Alex Rowain, co-director of the Climate Impacts Group at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. Thank you again for the introduction. My name is Alex Ruane, and I'm really happy to be joining uh, again today to talk about how we select climate change projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. Uh, this is part two of our training this year. Uh, part one was broadcast yesterday and uh, will be available online. Uh, this second part um, is focused on how do we choose a projection set for your application. Uh, just to recap, um, the goals for this overall RSET session um, are to, uh, to understand the various decisions and characteristics of projection sets uh, as we're considering our applications. Uh, part one was about what makes projection sets different, and this part two is on how do we choose a projection set for your application, including topics such as how do we match proje projection set characteristics, to a given application's needs, uh, how do we find advantages in using more updated versions, what are the trade-offs in using more complex projection sets, and what are the types of supporting materials that may make a projection set more appealing. All right, so as a recap of part one, um, we covered how mitigation, adaptation, and risk applications each have unique contexts in the assessment design and the type of climate information that might be of interest. Uh, climate projection sets come from climate models as a, as a solid foundation and are oriented towards decision making. And in that sense, we are, are looking to match uh, the decision making process with the climate information uh, provided by these projection sets. Uh, when we are considering climate projection sets, we, we might weigh the, the pros and cons of various characteristics of that climate projection set. And, and in the uh, previous part, we, we described what those fundamental characteristics are. These related to the global climate models that were used, the scenarios and storylines assessed, the extent to which downscaling connected global information down to regional and fine-scaled information, uh, the temporal resolution and the spatial resolution of the resulting climate projection set information, um, the degree to which post-processing uh, removed bias or adjusted characteristics of a uh, climate distribution uh, in that projection, and the, uh, the set of applications-ready variables that would be available in a given projection set uh, which may uh, indicate or restrict the use of certain types of follow-on models, uh, for example, agricultural models or fisheries models. In today's part, we're going to describe the considerations in choosing that projection set for a given application. So let's dive in. The first goal here is to understand how a projection set's characteristics might match a given application's need. The process of selecting a climate projection set is again one where it is very helpful to engage with stakeholders in a co-development process. Um, we mentioned this in the previous part, but here we want to emphasize that 
it is important to connect to the system vulnerabilities that we hope to, uh, to reduce and the decision-making process uh, in terms of the types of investment or intervention that might be used uh, for adaptation, mitigation, or risk management. Um, as we're thinking about this, we have to understand, for example, that vulnerabilities may be different in different sectors um, and that the, the different stakeholders and scientists involved in the process each bring their own values and motivations uh, in, in terms of how we're going to be selecting the process. Now, overall, the projection sets are going to be coming from some combination of historical uh, information, climate simulations, a recognition of what are the dominant weather and climate processes, and the storylines that we might be interested in exploring, including potentially complex and high impact events. This motivations word here is also quite important to recognize that decision making is usually not only uh, decided upon uh, according to the climate information in isolation. Uh, stakeholders are often weighing various uh, additional pressures, including socioeconomic uh, development, uh, the, the potential for profit, uh, political influences, the availability of resources, and many other uh, ethical and, and additional choices. Um, so climate information is part of a much larger process, uh, but the values and motivations uh, reach all the way to the point of deciding on which climate projection sets and information will be used. An important aspect of selecting a climate projection set is our goal of targeting useful climate information. Uh, it is useful to, to potentially use a new framework developed in the last IPCC assessment uh, around the concept of climatic impact drivers, or CIDs. A CID is a climate condition that directly affects elements of society or ecosystems. CIDs and their changes can lead to positive, negative, or inconsequential outcomes, or a mixture of all of these. Uh, and this depends strongly on the system that's in question. Uh, it's important to think about this from a climate information perspective to realize that a change in a climate condition itself is not necessarily risky unless it is connected with some kind of vulnerability or exposed asset. Um, such that we might determine that it is a climate hazard and think about how we might protect against risks or adapt or mitigate uh, to reduce those risks. CIDs have been designed to be a comprehensive look across uh, major types of climate conditions that affect society uh, and, and natural ecosystems. We organize them around fundamental aspects of the climate system, such as temperature, uh, the water cycle, wind and storms, the cryosphere, uh, other conditions like atmospheric uh, chemistry and, and radiation, coastal threats like sea level rise and flooding, and open ocean conditions, including things like marine heat waves, ocean acidity, and, and other uh, properties of, of the ocean. Um, these are broad categories, uh, but include important distinctions. For example, the, the difference between an average temperature increase and extreme heat conditions or the difference between hydrological drought, looking at available water resources on the surface or in aquifers, compared to something like agricultural and ecological drought, which focuses on soil moisture availability uh, for, for growing plants and, uh, and animals. Uh, these are a, a set of, of CID categories that we will uh, expand upon and elaborate upon as we're thinking about the types of climate information that is important. But if we're planning on choosing a projection set, we want to ensure that the design of that projection set and the characteristics of that projection set will get us to the, the types of climatic impact drivers that we need to understand. Uh, one last aspect to note about climatic impact drivers is that we are interested in different ways that these climate conditions manifest. For example, if we're looking at something like extreme heat, we might want to know the intensity of that heat wave. We might also want to know the frequency with which a given heat might be surpassed, a given temperature might be surpassed. Uh, we also might want to know how long a heat wave is, uh, the seasonal timing, whether that heat wave is coming early in a planting season or late when, when crops are already uh, in their flowering stages, for example. Um, and then also, what is the spatial extent? For example, how far will a flood reach? Or what is the, uh, the, the geographic domain that might be affected by a given hurricane? We have mapped many of these climatic impact drivers to different sectors to try to understand what type of climate information we might request 
uh, depending on, on the system that you're interested in protecting. Um, for example, here is a, a, a portion of a table in, in the Working Group 1, Chapter 12, uh, that is looking at the agricultural sector, looking at food, fiber, and other ecosystem products. Um, this was elaborated further in Working Group 2, Chapter 5, but here our goal was just to say, what are the areas that we know have a strong impacts and risk relevance uh, for, for things like cropping systems? So let's focus on this top row here. And every place that you see shaded colors are places where you might want to look for climate information uh, in terms of understanding future risks. The darkest colors are the, are the places where we see the most acute types of changes um, and impacts. However, it's important to note that the, the existence of a connection does not necessarily mean that the climate information is available or robust. One of the things we wanna do with the climatic impact driver approach is develop a set of indices that capture key aspects of the operational ranges and tolerance thresholds of given systems. Here is an example uh, from the FAQ of, of IPCC Working Group 1, Chapter 12. Uh, that looks at specifically interesting thresholds uh, in the life cycle of a plant. And in this case, we're looking at a, a corn or a maize plant. In general, there is higher crop production and more growth when temperatures are within a certain range. Um, but as we cross a critical temperature threshold, we start to see reduced growth uh, due to biophysical processes being interrupted within the plant. And then we might reach a limited temperature threshold by which you start to have uh, much stronger and potentially uh, irreversible responses, including crop failure. Um, by talking with uh, stakeholders, by, by working with crop physiologists, uh, we can determine these types of thresholds and we can design our climate information around specific indices and threshold temperatures uh, to understand these key transitions and how we might protect against them for example, finding plants with seeds that have higher tolerance and maybe moves these thresholds towards temperatures that will make us in a better place for future climate conditions. This is just an example from the agricultural sector, but many systems and, and uh, aspects of society and nature have these types of tolerance thresholds and working in a co-development process helps us figure out how we can target our climate information to support this type of decision and planning process. As we're thinking about this, we also uh, are going to look at uh, more specialized applications um, that may have tailored projection characteristics. So for example, we may want to find that um, specific indices or specific combinations of information are more directly related to uh, vulnerability or exposure. In, in the maps that you see on the screen here, we are looking at the NOAA heat index, which is a combination of extreme temperatures and humidities that have been identified as uh, connecting strongly to the, the human body's ability to self-regulate temperature um, through perspiration or other types of, uh, of temperature control. So this heat index being over 41 degrees is uh, a, a qualification that NOAA has determined as being dangerous for outdoor exercise and outdoor labor, for example, in the construction or agricultural fields. Um, what you see on the screen, therefore, is not just a projection of temperature, but a projection of conditions that are likely to be challenging uh, for those outdoor conditions. Uh, and you can see it now across different time periods under different scenarios going out into the future. So this, uh, this ability to create sector relevant tolerant thresholds even in combination are important and again point to the types of variables that you might need to find in your climate information. When we are deciding on the, uh, the climate projection sets we also want to make sure that the scale of analysis enables decisions. So are the projections that we need at a single point or across a broader domain? Uh, a point-based analysis, for example, somebody who's concerned about a single town or a single agricultural field um, or a particular uh, national park, um, those point-based analyses can allow more complex approaches because we don't have to cover su such a big area. Um, we may be able to focus our, our resources on just one point 
uh, and we don't have to be as concerned about spatial coherence uh, across surrounding regions. Um, likewise, if a decision is, is being made, we have to ask if the, the region uh, has high quality local observations. This is particularly important uh, in areas that are data sparse or data rich, where bias adjustment techniques may work better um, when observations are strong. This is, this is the type of information that is going to help us decide whether we want to focus on an observations and bias adjustment heavy approach or one more rooted on core physical processes uh, and understanding. For example, using dynamically downscaled models uh, to fill in gaps in observations. We also may ask whether uh, the decisions that we're making are intending on using further impacts models. So for example, are we trying to look at a single climatic impact driver index like that heat index for health, or do we wanna drive a more complex impact model uh, like a true human physiological model in, in incorporating different labor types and outdoor exposure times uh, and, and developing uh, information about uh, disease and long-term uh, health impacts. Some kind of physiological model may require more coherence across space, across time, and across variables. Um, and this is the type of information that uh, if we know that it is needed, we can decide on projection sets that are able to meet those needs. When we're looking to, to build on climate projection sets, one of the things we wanna do is uh, check the version control, check, check which version we are using and whether it is the most up-to-date version. And the reason we're interested in doing that is because there are substantial improvements over time in all aspects of climate projections. So as we noted before in these seven categories of characteristics on, of, of climate projection sets, um, they are, are each improving. And let's talk about what we mean by that. In terms of the climate models, um, we recommend that you aim for CMIP6 models rather than CMIP5. And at this point, uh, in, in many cases, uh, scientific studies that use CMIP3 or older data sets are, are rejected as, as being too old or, or antiquated versions. Um, so be cautious and, and if possible, if all else is equal, look for CMIP6 outputs. These have improved spatial resolution, improved physics and process representation, and there are more models with heightened diagnostic information that you can look at. Just as an illustration of this, what we're looking at is a figure from IPCC chapter one, uh, and what we're looking here is on the y-axis is the horizontal resolution and the, the x-axis is the, the um, oceanic horizontal res resolution. So the atmosphere and the ocean uh, spatial resolutions. And in, in this cloud of dots, you see the distribution of models from the CMIP5 uh, projection sets. In CMIP6 and even more so in the high-res MIP uh, component of CMIP6, you can see the new cloud of models, which has generally moved in the upper right direction, which means towards finer resolution, higher resolution information um, that is available with this new set of CMIP6 models. So if, if you're looking uh, for a projection set, you go for the, the more recent models, you're more likely to get higher resolution and a larger ensemble to choose from. Uh, when we're looking to scenarios and storylines, it's important to, to think about uh, projection sets that give you information about global warming levels and SSP RCPs rather than the more older RCPs and SRES scenarios. Um, the scenarios community is large and is constantly tracking many dynamically interacting aspects of society. And we've seen huge changes in technology and socioeconomic growth, even in the recent decades since the SRES scenarios came out. Um, for example, uh, the, in, in terms of unforeseen events, just to list a couple here, the September 11th uh, attacks came after the SRES scenario came out, and we can think about the disruptions that that has caused in the world. The Paris Agreement was in 2015. COVID-19 is recently uh, causing turmoil around the world. We see the conflict in Ukraine, and a dramatic drop in green energy costs, as illustrated on the right here uh, from, from the IPCC Working Group 3, um, where you see huge decreases in the cost of photovoltaics and onshore wind energy, uh, offshore wind and concentrating solar power. All these prices coming down 
in addition to the cost of uh, electric vehicle batteries, um, has led not only to changes in the economics, but also huge increases in adoption around the world. Uh, these are the types of information that change the, the beginning conditions of these scenarios and uh, allows us to have a, a focus on uh, you know, what the current state and, and likely evolution of society will look like in, in the coming decades, depending on the choices that we make from here forward. Um, there's also been huge changes in transitioning economies um, and developing countries that, that need consistent updates. Um, I also note again this renewed focus on global warming levels, which are increasingly used as a, uh, a, a approach connecting different elements of climate information and policy around emissions and land use. Uh, and in that sense, a lot of policymakers are looking for this type of information. Um, and in that sense, uh, that recommends certain projection sets. Uh, there have also been substantial improvements in downscaling. Um, and what we would recommend here is to look for models that are connected to strong benchmarking and intercomparison efforts. One of the big advantages in recent decades has been uh, the development of the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment, or CORDEX, which has created common domains and, uh, and formatting uh, uh, templates so that we have uh, established consistent sets of simulations and outputs that we can use across a wide variety of applications. I'm going to talk more about Cortex on a later slide. Um, we've also seen big increases in um, uh, convection resolving models that are able to get to much finer resolution. On the right, you see an example of a convection resolving model which has improved our ability to capture the diurnal cycle of precipitation across the United States. Um, this has been a notoriously difficult challenge, but we're starting to get to the scales that allow us to capture these fundamental processes which are related to extreme precipitation and flooding events across the country. Um, in general, uh, the reason we particularly call your attention to these benchmarking and intercomparison efforts is because this has allowed us to better understand what we are working with and utilize some of the same ensemble approaches which have proven successful on the global scale, now bringing these down to the regional scale. Um, and the documentation and other uh, benchmarking evaluations uh, really help us understand the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. More recent climate projection sets are also more likely to have high resolution information. The Earth Systems Modeling community is providing more models and more ensemble members with daily and hourly outputs. And we are also seeing spatial resolutions increasing, not just from the model improvements, but also in terms of how we do downscaling and bias adjustment. As we look to improvements in bias adjustment and post-processing, we also note big improvements in bias adjustment techniques uh, that are improving with better methods, data sets, and computational power. We have seen new methodologies emerge, including machine learning approaches that maintain coherence between complex variables that might be relevant to your system. Um, there have also been new methods that have emerged to maintain trends while also doing bias adjustment across space and across variables. Um, and there are huge improvements in underlying observational data sets, which again is why NASA plays such an important role in observing our climate system and providing this type of data uh, so that we can have better coherence and robustness in our regional features and the climate system. On the right, you'll see a summary of differences between two different climate projection sets. In this case, uh, su subsequent versions of the NASA Earth Exchange Global Daily Downscaled product, uh, which we'll talk about more in a future slide. And what we're looking at here is a comparison between an older version, uh, which was the CAN ESM2 uh, climate model from Canada, running the standalone RCP 8.5. This was a CMIP 5 simulation, as you can see by the fact that it was using just RCP 8.5. Um, this is compared to a newer version, the CAN ESM 5 now, um, which is running the SSP 585 and uh, also includes uh, in, improvements in the, the methodologies of the, uh, the bias adjustment. When you look at this, there are substantial and consequential changes 
in the temperature between these two future projections at the end of the, the 21st century. Um, these are both what would be considered very high emission scenarios, but the consequence of choosing a more updated scenario set uh, is, is quite apparent in terms of the temperature differences that might go further down your application. The climate applications community has been very excited to see that many projection sets are now including information beyond the standard temperature and precipitation. Um, because the Earth system modeling groups have made more variables available, projection sets are also now able to, to capture uh, complex variable combinations, which allow us to, to extend beyond simple climate metrics into the types of information that allows us to look at agricultural systems, ecosystems, water resources, health, and many of the other sectors mentioned above. Um, there has also been concerted efforts across the different uh, impacts modeling areas and, and impact groups to develop variable packages that ensure that we can run more complex models for each impact sector and, and understand the key vulnerabilities there. Uh, there is an effort within CMIP6 called the Vulnerability Impacts Adaptation and Climate Services Advisory Board or the VX Advisory Board. Uh, which identified different variables that were of interest to the impacts community and encouraged the Earth System modeling groups involved in CMIP6 to provide those variables. They also identified additional variables and created downloadable packages that include sets of variables that would be suitable, for example, for crop model applications. There has also been an effort uh, led by the Intersectoral Impacts Model Intercomparison Project, or EZMIP, uh, which we'll detail on a later slide that is uh, concentrating on making sure that the variables are available to run a whole sequence or a whole series of impact models in a consistent way. Um, there's also been efforts within the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, or AGMIP, uh, to think about different climate projection sets that are suitable for agricultural modeling, like crop models and food system economic models. And there have been additional similar efforts uh, in communities around forestry and fisheries and ecosystems, uh, including, for example, identifying a, a, a series of bioclim variables that are appropriate for ecosystem suitability mapping. At this point, it's useful to go back and examine some of the common climate projection sets that we have alluded to in, in the recent slides. As I'm going through these projection sets, I encourage you to think about how we are describing these projection sets according to the fundamental characteristics of climate projection sets that we described in part one of this training and where we have highlighted improvements in recent versions in the, uh, this part two of the training. That means look for information around the climate models that are used, the scenarios and storylines that have been assessed, the downscaling techniques that have been applied, the temporal and spatial resolutions of the outputs, as well as any bias adjustment that have resulted in a set of applications ready variables uh, that can be plugged into a, a number of applications models and further assessments. So we mentioned earlier the Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment, or CORDEX. This is a, a, an effort that has uh, been going on now for, for about a decade that is looking at the coordination uh, between global and regional models so that we can produce regional climate projections across a set of common domains. We have, uh, in, in Cordex, they have standardized the, the domains, the formats of inputs and outputs, the variable units, uh, and the specific simulation experiments or scenarios uh, that are being run across these diverse GCM and RCM combinations. Uh, in Cordex, uh, right now, the, the latest simulations that are available come from CMIP5. Uh, CMIP6 uh, simulations are still coming, uh, but there are 14 domains across the globe, each with, uh, with different GCM-RCM combinations. Uh, they tend to run two to three RCP scenarios uh, with spatial resolution from 0.22 to 0.44 degrees and outputs that come on a daily to a monthly time frame. There are many, many climate variables available, uh, especially if you get in touch with the Cordex groups directly. Um, but of course, being a, a dynamically downscaled uh, set of simulations, uh, they, they do include biases and therefore additional bias adjustment may be necessary. And um, 
there tends to be a lag between the latest global climate model outputs and the uh, the the uh, availability of dynamically downscaled products. Uh, first and foremost, because we need the global model outputs to run these dynamically downscaled products, and therefore you tend to have statistical downscaling approaches available before the uh, the the dynamically downscaled products are available. So those are some drawbacks of what you might find in Cortex, but if you're looking for dynamically downscaled projections uh, in almost all land regions of the world, uh, you can expect to find something from Cortex. Another important product to, to discuss is the NASA Earth Exchange climate projection sets that come out of NASA Ames. Uh, the advantage of, of this product is that they have standardized formats but produce multiple methods of climate projections um, which allow interesting intercomparisons. The next global daily downscaled product or GDDP uh, currently features 35 CMIP6 GCMs, has four SSP RCP scenarios for most of those GCMs, uh, has a global quarter degree resolution domain, and was bias adjusted using a global meteorological forcing data set, which itself was bias adjusted using a combination of observations in the historical period. There are nine climate variables for most of these GCMs, which allow many different impact applications, and outputs are available on a daily schedule. The next localized uh, constructed analogs products, or next loca, um, is coming soon for CMIP6 output and is available already for CMIP5. And this includes uh, approximately one kilometer resolution over the United States with monthly outputs. Um, so the, the exciting thing about NEXT is that we can compare across different methods. And here's just an example on the right of the NEXT GDDP. And what we're looking at is the year where localized warming uh, compared to the 1950 to 1979 period exceeds two degrees Celsius. So the places in red are the portions of the world where warming is occurring much faster uh, than places in blue, for example. Uh, and you can see that several of these places have already warmed by more than two degrees compared to, to this earlier 21st century period. The Easy MIP project or the Intersectoral Impacts Model Intercomparison Project um, was designed to uh, allow coordinated extensions of climate projections into a series of impact sectors. So you can see on the right here all of the various sectors that are participating in EasyMIP, um, which allow climate projection sets to, to be run, for example, in agriculture and in water resources, um, so that we can then combine across all of these different areas and have cross-sectoral cross science uh, and systems uh, thinking approaches to how all of these changes might interact and lead to pressures on society and nature. So EasyMIP to do this had to create a set of climate information that could be used for all of these sectors and, uh, and used to, to run more complex impact models in many of these sectors. EasyMIP was also under a tremendous amount of pressure to do this quickly so that these models could be run and inform the IPCC process. And in the end, they created a consistent downscale bias adjusted set of climate projections uh, that can serve as drivers across multiple impact sectors and scales. Uh, this comes out of an international network of impacts modeling groups. And uh, what they have for their climate projection sets uh, were five CMIP6 GCMs available very early in the IPCC process for AR6. Um, there are additional models still coming online. And for these, they have three SSP RCP combinations, uh, including the, the SSP 1 2.6 and the SSP 3 7.0, uh, which are fundamental to a lot of uh, the current upper and lower bound projections. Um, the projection set comes at a global 0.5 degree domain and was bias adjusted using uh, a series of historical climate forcing data sets stemming from the, the uh, European reanalysis uh, that is called WFDE5. Um, there are daily outputs and 11 climate variables that have been selected to enable impacts model simulations across all of these different sectors. Now, 
Some of the other things we have to note is that there are trade-offs in using the more complex climate projection sets. Over the course of this presentation, we have noted uh, features that tend to push us towards more variables at higher resolutions um, and across more models and scenarios. Uh, it's not always so simple as to just go for the most high detailed information that is available, and let's tell you why. The existence of data at higher resolution does not necessarily indicate higher quality information. In particular, we warn you that there is a potential illusion of false levels of detail uh, when the, the data are of highest quality. And in particular, we would warn you when interacting with stakeholders, when you show them maps, uh, they will almost certainly prefer the maps with the highest resolution. And it is important for the science and experts to indicate the level of fidelity uh, and potential for, for uh, a false sense of certainty when using that high resolution information. This is especially important in data sparse regions where it is difficult to benchmark what is actually correct. Um, and when using observational data sets, it's important to, to note that bias correction may want to use a, a lower resolution with higher fidelity uh, than, than what you might get at the highest uh, highest resolution of the outputs. Uh, in particular, uh, it's important to recognize that applications are, are often limited by resources and going for the highest resolution data set will, will require more computational space and processing time. What you see on the right here is, is an example of some of these uh, complexities. And we're looking in this case at the country of Afghanistan in the middle of the map. Um, and we're looking at precipitation. And what you'll see is different products uh, certainly have different resolutions. And this is particularly striking over the mountainous regions. Um, each of these data sets may have important information, um, but going to the highest resolution, as you might see in this upper right, includes trade-offs. For example, this Chelsea climatology does not give you anything related to a daily set of outputs. Uh, if you were to do a, a bias adjustment using this Chelsea climatology, you would end up with a very large amount of data um, that you would have to weigh the benefits uh, depending on the applications that you're, you're interested in. Uh, so understanding how these different data sets that may even disagree in terms of precipitation uh, and have different levels of detail, how do you pull these things together uh, in, the, in the context of resources and stakeholder needs uh, is an important challenge for projection sets. One other thing that's important to recognize, uh, especially when thinking about uh, spatial and temporal resolutions, uh, is the trade-offs in, in using these more complex kind of projection sets in the context of a full application. So I'm going to give an example here of a situation where we are trying to figure out how much information we need uh, for a given application. And in this case, we're going to look at a, a, an hourly projection set so we have 24 hours in the day, 30 or so days in a month, 12 months in a year, uh, maybe 120 years looking from 1980 to 2100 uh, across four different climate scenarios, uh, let's say 20 different Earth system models with five ensemble members each, and we're looking at, at four output variables uh, for our uh, assessment. If you look at all of these things in combination, this ends up being more than 1.6 billion data points just for one location. We haven't even started to talk about maps. Um, so the effort to have hourly output compared to something like monthly output is itself a 720 times increase in the in the temporal, uh, or sorry, in, in the amount of data that is required. And you can imagine that each of these steps along the way uh, force these types of decisions. For example, across these, maybe we want fewer years or fewer ESMs since these numbers seem to stand out as, as larger numbers. These types of trade-offs are very important in making projection set decisions. Um, and uh, it's important to, to recognize that as you're getting towards the, the highest demands of, of temporal outputs, there are fewer and fewer ESMs that have posted outputs at those high temporal resolutions. I noted earlier that there are more now in CMIP6 than there were in CMIP5, but out of the entire set of CMIP6 projections and modeling groups, uh, it is a much smaller group that provides hourly outputs. In developing 
climate applications, you often run into a situation where you uh, run out of resources and are forced to decide how to reduce the overall set of climate projection sets that are, uh, that are analyzed. Um, one of the areas that is often considered for subsetting is the number of climate models that are used. And there are a couple of approaches that we want to describe. Uh, for a long time, especially through about the CMIP-5 timeframe, the, the common approach was to, to, whenever possible, stick with what was deemed as model democracy. Uh, this is the basic idea of one model gets one vote, um, so do not try to subset or come up with weights to, to, uh, to selectively weigh more models more than others in creating ensembles. Um, but this really runs into problems when you are connecting into full applications. Uh, on the right is an example that comes out of the AgMIP, uh, Agricultural Modeling Applications, uh, where we ran into a resource constraint when we realized that all of the climate projection sets were again going to, to be driven into multiple crop models and multiple economic models, each of which had multiple adaptations and societal pathways that they wanted to examine. The overall combination was overwhelming and beyond the amount of resources that we could devote to this project. So in discussions with stakeholders, we developed an approach that allowed us to, to focus on key storylines that were fundamental to applications decisions. What you see on the right here is a, a cloud of all of the projections in terms of, of growing season temperature change on the x-axis and precipitation change on the y-axis over this May, June, July, August, September growing season. The current conditions are represented by a black square and the future projections in terms of changes are represented by all these triangles across the CMIP-5 models that were being examined. Um, this overall set of projections was too much, but what the stakeholders decided was that we would find representative models that looked at relatively hot and dry conditions uh, represented in this red quadrant, relatively hot and wet conditions in this yellow quadrant, relatively cool and wet conditions in green, and relatively cool and dry conditions in blue, although it's important to note that relatively cool was still several degrees Celsius warmer than the current period. Uh, all of these in addition to the, the center of the distribution represented by these black boxes. Um, there is a whole methodology you can read about in this Ruane and McDermott paper, but the important thing to note here is that we developed an approach that allowed us to, to find these fundamental characteristics of growing season changes, which were uh, enabling us to, to consider specific adaptation interventions uh, for corn in Ames, Iowa. Model subsets uh, can also be determined according to physical constraints. And there is a, a very active discussion right now in the, in the physical climate community around what are called hot models. Um, a couple papers here you can read, uh, including uh, from the IPCC. Um, and it's important to know in, in thinking about subsets around physical constraints, uh, some key terms that are, are quite useful. So the first is the equilibrium climate sensitivity or ECS, which the IPCC defines as the equilibrium or steady state change in the surface temperature following a doubling of the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations from pre-industrial conditions. Um, this is a, a basic way of saying if you in, in impose a fundamental anthropogenic climate change signal, what is the resulting uh, equilibrium state of the climate system, how much hotter has it become? Um, the second variable is this, or the second metric is this transient climate response which is defined as the surface temperature response for the hypothetical scenario in which atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations increase at 1% per year from pre-industrial to the time of a doubling of atmospheric CO2 concentration in year 70. This is a convoluted definition, but what it really is saying is that if you increase the greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse gas concentrations, in a steady rate, how does the climate res system respond as it is seeking that new equilibrium? So again, the equilibrium climate response talks about the, the steady state equilibrium response to a, a greenhouse gas forcing. And this transient climate response talks about the, the transition from one state to the next in response to that greenhouse gas forcing. Now, these are metrics you can calculate for the climate models because of CMIP-6 simulations that were designed and, and uh, executed. 
And the IPCC assessed a very likely range for this ECS metric of two to five degrees Celsius. Um, likewise, they assessed a very likely range for the transient climate response, or TCR, to be 1.2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius. When we look across the range of CMIP-5 models and CMIP-6 models, um, we can actually see different equilibrium climate sensitivities across these models and compare it to the IPCC best estimate and that range uh, of very likely uh, ECS values. Um, this indicates that there are certain models that are beyond that very likely range, both on the high and the low end, uh, which could be a, a reason to create a subset uh, that, that focuses more on those that fall within this very likely range. This is an example of a physical constraint that might dictate a, uh, a subset of models that you want to use in your climate projection sets uh, to make sure you're, you're staying within that IPCC assessment. So in, in the bottom line here, beware of models with equilibrium climate sensitivities or transient climate responses that are beyond the assessed range. Um, and, and the so-called hot models may be overly sensitive to greenhouse gas emissions and aerosol changes uh, in, in the future periods. Uh, finally, the, the, there are a set of supporting materials that make a climate projection set more appealing. Climate projection sets are particularly useful when they come with clear guidance material, uh, oftentimes created by those who generated the climate projection sets themselves. Um, including, for example, documentation that indicates the suggested use, caveats, and potential pitfalls of, of projection set applications. Um, there are also very useful information technology products that can form reformatting pipelines. Uh, for example, if there is, uh, are tools available to repackage outputs from a climate projection set into formats that are common for applications. For example, there is a, an IT team within AGMIP that has created translators uh, that allow us to take climate projection sets and reformat them for specific crop model applications. It's also quite useful to have uh, online access to climate projection sets through the cloud. Um, and those climate projection sets that are available via cloud services uh, avoid the potential complication of downloading maybe terabytes of outputs, um, which can be restrictive and, and potentially uh, uh, eliminating uh, the potential for, for applications uh, in many parts of the world. There are also great benefits to having climate projection sets that are available in uh, online visualization tools that allow quick graphical display of key projection set features. And we'll talk more about those now because there are a large set of, of emerging tools available online. This is just a subset of some that are available. Um, there's the SciTools tool from the UK uh, that allows you to quickly create uh, slides such as, uh, as what you see on the, in the bottom left here. Um, there's also the, the Climate Analytics Climate Impact Explorer, uh, the KNMI Climate Explorer, which you can see on the right here, which allows you to select different temperature and, and other time series and, and quickly display those. Um, and then there is the IPCC Working Group One Interactive Atlas. Um, the, the Interactive Atlas is unique in this sixth assessment report cycle in the sense that it is not just a static set of maps, but it is an online tool that allows you to uh, interactively uh, display different aspects of climate systems. Um, I'll note very quickly, this bottom line here shows, again, some of the key features that need to be understood about any given kind of projection set. So in this case, what, what we're looking at is a set of CMIP-6 model runs. Um, there actually says over here that there are 23 climate models that are used, and we're looking at a climatic impact driver index, the cooling degree days, uh, which are, is an important element of, of home energy uh, for example, for air conditioning. Um, we're looking at uh, the, the future time slice under the SSP3-7.0, uh, this mid-century time slice. Um, and the Interactive Atlas allows this quick exploration of what's available. And in some cases, this might be exactly what is needed for a given application. Um, and there are many different data sets that could be chosen and variables and scenarios uh, that, that can be displayed here. It's also exciting on the, the, 
the IPCC Interactive Atlas, uh, because there is a new display of, uh, of assessed changes for climatic impact drivers all around the world. This is a stylized version of the world map uh, divided into uh, about 50 specific regions uh, that show uh, fundamental changes in climatic impact drivers. Uh, and again, this is interactive, allowing you to see uh, in different parts of the world. For example, here is North America and South America. Um, and this allows you to understand changes in multiple variables, different levels of confidence and trends, and even the attribution to the, to the human signal. Uh, one last one last online uh, tool that we wanted to, to note uh, is this climate mapping for resilience and adaptation, which just came out of a White House initiative uh, in partnership with Esri. Um, and you can see at the bottom again, um, I, I guess I didn't highlight it here, but there is this uh, indication. This is the LOCA data set that we mentioned earlier, um, and you can explore several different climate variables there. It's also important to note when using climate projection sets that this information is often associated with a particular data license. Some projection sets are public goods that were created to encourage application across a broad variety of, of uh, adaptation, mitigation, and risk management uses. Um, but other projection sets are commercial products and could even be quite expensive. In that sense, we encourage all of you to clarify the data license uh, and understand the legal parameters for authorized use of a given climate projection set. In some cases, this might not be determined or not declared, uh, or you might find that the, the, the projection sets are proprietary and are not for public use. Uh, in many cases, there is some kind of conditional limited data license uh, where the conditions are determined by the project, projection set creator. Uh, and if you can satisfy those conditions, then you can use the data license. Um, there are some broad categories also, for example, they might be open and non-commercial, which means you can openly use those as long as you're not trying to make a profit off of them, if it's not a commercial application. Um, but then, then there are others that are open, including for a commercial application. So we would encourage you to look for these um, and understand um, to make sure you're not running afoul of, of the creators of the projection sets and any legal requirements they might have. It's also important to note that there are potentially related products uh, in, the, in terms of the climate projection sets. Um, climate projection sets may therefore be appealing because a new application will instantly connect you into existing applications. So an example of this is the US National Climate Assessment, which used the CMIP-5 LOCA projections from, um, that we described er earlier, these localized constructed analogs. Um, any new assessment that you do with these CMIP-5 LOCA projections can instantly be compared to the published assessment, and the results from any new assessments could even be combined with these existing results uh, to look at larger systems connections and pressures. For example, you might take the water resource results um, and connect them to agricultural models. Um, in this sense, you may want to engage with your stakeholders uh, and, and the expert stakeholder uh, interface in that co-development uh, can help determine the extent to which the, the results from a particular application may want to be contextualized or extended to others, uh, which may draw your attention towards a particular projection set. Um, this is especially useful when linking into economy-wide and systems models, such as integrated assessment models. Uh, the last thing that we wanted to note is that there are, are uh, important credit to be given to the projection set creators. Uh, we would encourage you to make sure you cite the projection sets in any publications or in, in using the data set um, and to understand the, the funding uh, and use of the data sets um, as they were originally created. Um, there might also be important links to, to note, for example, if a, a data set were created as part of a larger project. Um, that would be worth noting, for example, if it came out of EasyMIP um, or, or some other larger effort. Um, and uh, if there are detailed documentations online, um, you know, there, there might be citations for you to, to cite. Uh, it's also, of course, worth uh, noting where you can get the, the data um, and who might be a primary person of contact uh, and if that person is active or not uh, might help as you're deciding, you know, how far you want to go, uh, if, if you can get a hold of those people and they're willing to, uh, to provide feedback, uh, that can be a, a very nice thing uh, in, in applying a, a data set. 
So to summarize, um, what we've looked at in part two is recognition that projection set selections depend strongly on a given application's needs. Uh, there is close engagement with stakeholders. Uh, it is a very important process in terms of identifying climate information for particular decision processes, um, identifying which climate information is relevant to your system, and at the scale of decision making uh, goes a long way. Um, there have also been steady improvements in all characteristics of climate projection set generation, uh, and this underscores the appeal of using cutting edge projection sets uh, whenever possible. It's also important to recognize that more complex projection sets are not necessarily better. Uh, we especially looked at the, the potential drawbacks of resource constraints, uh, as well as uh, a, a risky illusion of high levels of detail when using high complexity information. We noted that online tools, support, and documentations may make projection sets more appealing, um, and that it is important to connect with applications beyond your immediate focus, and in some sense, using the same kind of projection sets as others have, make that process more possible. So if we revisit the overall goals of this RSET training session, um, we wanted to understand how we can select a set of climate projections to use for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. In part one, we thought about what makes projection sets different. We thought about the context of applications areas, uh, as well as where the climate projection sets come from in their foundations, and the key distinguishing features that might make a climate projection set stand out. In part two, we looked at how we would choose a projection set for a given application, and that began with matching the characteristics with the given application's needs, including uh, the fundamental characteristics of the system in question and the decision context. Uh, we talked about the advantage of using more updated versions and trade-offs in more complex projection sets uh, and the various supporting materials that make a projection set more appealing. And with that, we, we thank you very much for your continued attention over these two uh, training days. And we are excited about uh, fielding any further questions and wish you all the best in whatever climate applications you have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. We will now transition to the question and answer session. Please enter your questions into the question and answer box. We'll answer your questions in the order in which they are received. We will also post this question and answer document for you to use as a reference to the training webpage following the, the conclusion of the webinar. Please feel free to contact myself or Alex should you have any questions about today's presentation. You can also access the training webpage and the RSET website in the links provided below. Also, please follow us on Twitter and check out our sister programs, Develop and Severe. Thank you. We have had a lot of great questions coming in throughout the presentation, and we are going to do our best to address these as much as we can over the next 32 minutes. So, uh, Alex, um, <clears throat> I guess we'll just go ahead and start with question one. The, uh, could you elaborate more about the NOAA heat index? Was the threshold over 41? Yeah, so uh, the, the NOAA heat index um, is one of the, uh, the heat indices that understands that humans respond not just to temperature, but to the overall um, combination of heat and humidity that affects things like how you know, sweat evaporates from our body and, and how we can self-regulate our temperature. Um, so the, the NOAA heat index, for example, is one of those things that would allow you to understand that uh, temperatures that are hot and humid can actually feel more oppressive and more dangerous than the uh, temperatures that might be even hotter but with low humidity. Um, I think most people have experienced this, but the heat index quantifies that. And um, the various National Weather Service centers have, have, a, have identified specific thresholds that are, are of importance. This 41 degrees Celsius threshold is, is one that is used to, to denote dangerous conditions, but I'll note that there are other National Weather Service centers that might use 39 degrees Celsius or things like that. This is one of the challenges of, of picking specific indices rather than having a, a true physiological model. 
Um, and there is additional clinical work being done right now to figure out if, if this 41 degrees C threshold uh, is useful for different populations and different outdoor or indoor activities. Uh, so there's a, an active area of research around this, um, and, and it's one that, that is quite interesting if, if you're uh, interested in, in the health impacts of climate change. And very relevant right now with the heat indices. Um, question two. I intend to use CMIP SSP RCPs to explore future water and food scenarios. And the question is uh, just looking for additional training or resources or working knowledge on selecting and downscaling uh, climate pathways and GCMs. Yeah, so I, I guess I would say that this training is a good place to start. Um, the CMIP 6 SSP RCPs are the, the most recent set of climate uh, model projections on the global scale. Uh, so that's a very good starting point. Um, in, in terms of additional resources around these, um, I, I think the, the goal of this training was not to identify one specific set, and, and you might see this come up again in some of the questions below, um, but hopefully we've empowered you to, to ask the right types of questions and to seek out some of the, the specific data sets that we've mentioned here uh, and things that are like that. Um, there is increasing effort to create these projection sets and to advertise them around the world, and hopefully with the characteristics um, that we identify the different categories of characteristics, you'll be able to better understand what is in front of you and match it to your application needs. Um, specifically, if you're interested in, in water and food scenarios, you might look to the EasyMIP project, which has run both of those. Um, and on the food side, of course, there's also the AgMIP project um, that would have further information in terms of, of how, climate, how climate projections uh, interact with food systems. Great, thank you. And please, when we offer the survey that's going to come out in the next day, um, please, you know, mention that uh, as far as uh, future needs, as far as training, and it helps us uh, design trainings in our future for you. Question three, do we need to bias adjust the data set even if we are using the latest next GDP CMIP data sets, data sets? If the same is needed, are there any free of cost softwares for bias adjustments? So one of the advantages of this next product is that it already has undertaken bias adjustment. Um, so there, there is a, uh, a, an effort basically within Next to take those CMIP6 data sets and bias adjust them and, and set them on a common and, and commonly formatted uh, framework. So, um, so at that sense, you don't need to do additional bias adjustment unless you have reason to believe that you can improve upon uh, you can improve upon the bias adjustment that's already been done. So, for example, if you have even finer, uh, high-quality information for your region uh, and you feel that you want to do an additional bias adjustment, you could debate the, the benefits of that. Um, but, yeah, this is one of the advantages of using this data set is that you are uh, taking on a product that somebody has already used their expert approaches to, to bias adjust. Now, in terms of the way bias adjustment is done, again, I'm not going to, to select or recommend any specific ones, but there are tools that are out there to help with bias adjustment. Um, many groups uh, have published their, their methods, and there are even some R packages like Climate for R and others that, that might provide you some tools to help with that process. Uh, I know, for example, that the EasyMIP group has also created uh, tools that allow you to do, bi to do their form of bias adjustment on additional data sets. That's a nice clarification, thank you. Um, <clears throat> question four, are these packages for different impact modeling freely available? Yeah, so like I said, there, there are uh, packages within EasyMIP and, and AgMIP that you know are, are really um, trying to help you understand how, how we can make applications, especially in, in, uh, for AgMIP for food, for example. Um, so I'm not quite sure if this question is asking about packages for bias adjustment or for impact modeling, but I'll, I, I think I've addressed the, the bias side of it. But in terms of the impact models themselves, if, if you're interested in crop modeling, you might go to AgMIP and, and uh, figure out what crop models are available. Uh, if you're interested in, in health modeling, you might look in the IPCC uh, health chapter. I think it was chapter four from working group two. Um, uh, although now I'm doubting that. But yeah, Working Group 2 has sectoral chapters and, and uh, the, the health chapter would be very obvious to find. Um, and, and they would have references to, to the major models there. 
Um, and then EasyMIP as a, a kind of one-stop clearinghouse has, has models for, for most of the major impact sectors. Uh, so those are things you can find, but beware that the impact models are not black boxes. You'll need to understand them, uh, probably get some training so that you can apply them with, with expert judgment. Great, thank you. And uh, thankfully, in the uh, in true spirit of open science, uh, a lot of these communities make these uh, available. Question five is, and although this isn't designed to be prescriptive, this training, um, but maybe you can give a little bit more uh, considerations here. As of today, which is the more advantageous to use between CMIP 5 Cortex high resolution and the new CMIP 6 GCM low resolution for regional impacts, vulnerability, and or adaptation? Yeah, so this this is a, a, an interesting question, run, and one that we run across uh, quite often. And and I'll I'll rephrase it or or underscore the key message here, which is that um, the the dynamically downscaled models take a little bit more time to be to be run um, than the the global models for the simple fact that you need the global model output before you can run the dynamical model to downscale it. Um, likewise, the bias adjustment approaches tend to happen more quickly than the dynamically downscaled approaches because they are more computationally uh, expensive on the dynamical downscaling side. Um, so this question is fundamentally asking whether we should go with the additional downscaling power uh, but use older climate model output or should we use the newer climate model output and, and uh, avoid or, or uh, omit the, the dynamical downscaling. Uh, the, the only answer I can give here is that it depends on your application. If, if you need that fine scale set of features and want them to be responsive to climate change, um, then a dynamically downscaled approach might be more appealing. But you might also want to look at the difference between CMIP 5 and CMIP 6 in your region to see if there is fundamental differences in terms of temperature or wet and dry conditions that would at least give you an idea of what that trade-off would look like in either direction. Um, and then, of course, we can all... Uh, be excited about the, the forthcoming CMIP 6 set of Cortex simulations, uh, which will be a nice uh, and more consistent feature with the latest global runs. Question six, some of the newest generation of models from CMIP 6 are, quote, too hot and project climate warming in response to carbon dioxide emissions that might be larger than supported by other evidence. Has there been any work to improve projections to be more consistent with AR6 assessments? Yeah, so this question actually came in before we had the slide and the training on that. Um, so, uh, so we did address this in the training about, you know, this so-called hot models problem um, and the, the use of equilibrium climate sensitivity and transient climate response to characterize those models and understand uh, their potential use or, or exclusion if we're making some kind of a, a practical model ensemble. Um, I, I think, again, what it comes down to is resources and what types of, of decision processes are underway. Um, there are uh, stakeholders who might want to know the, the kind of uh, worst case scenarios or might be interested in the upper end of the distribution more than the lower end of the distribution. Even these hot models are based on, on uh, important physics, so we, we don't want to dismiss them outright. Um, there are also reasons for us to, to think that we can use global warming levels to include all types of models, um, but using the global warming levels to constrain kind of the, the questions that we're asking uh, and, and apply them on, on levels that we know are practical. Um, there's more discussions to be had around that, um, as we, we mentioned in the, in the previous training as well. Um, but this is a, an, an issue that is, is certainly worth keeping an eye on. Thank you. And question seven, for multiple models, how is the year of crossing GWL established? Is multi-model ensemble used to determine GWL? All right, so this GWL here again is the global warming levels. Um, and uh, the, there is an important distinction here, which is that if you have a given climate model um, and a given scenario, uh, that the global temperature is going to progress according to the, the emissions of that scenario and the climate responses of that climate model. So that some combination of the equilibrium climate sensitivity and, and even more applicable since it's a transient scenario would be the transient climate response. Um, so that means that each global warming level is gonna have a crossing year uh, that is dependent on a particular climate model and scenario. So we can use a moving window, usually at least 20 years long, 
to capture when those crossing moment or when those crossing years uh, are, are established. Uh, we don't want it to be too small of a window because the first year that it crosses the threshold, it might come back, you know, the, the following year due to internal variability. But using a 20-year window is, is looking at something more like a climatological period. Um, and we are now publishing, and you can find tables uh, from IPCC and, and from CMM6 that shows the, the global warming level crossing points for each model and scenario combination. Now, with those combinations uh, and with those crossing years figured out, you can create ensembles at the global warming level. Um, but I would, th I, I don't think it's possible to use an ensemble approach and then calculate the global warming levels because each member of that ensemble has its own crossing point. So good questions coming in, and thank you. Uh, we hope that uh, these uh, clarifications uh, are really getting to the, uh, the answers for you. Question eight. Kindly state the four CMIP-6 SSP RCP scenarios that are available in NASA Earth Exchange GCMs. All right, so this is just a quick factorial response. Um, we have uh, SSP-1 2.6, SSP-2 4.5, SSP-3 7.0, and SSP-5 8.5. Um, but it's also important to note that you have to go in there and look to see if those are available for each of the ESMs. Um, if you recall from the previous set of, uh, of trainings, uh, there was this highest tier of, of simulation sets. Uh, and in general, it's, it's quite clear in the outputs that there are more SSP 5 8.5 simulations than SSP 3 7.0 simulations, for example. Um, so you'd have to check to see which ones are available, but those are the, the four most common scenarios you would find. Um, I believe the first round of next scenarios focused on the um, SSP 5 8.5 and, uh, and then one of the lower two scenarios, I don't remember exactly which one was first, um, but they are continually trying to work and fill in uh, additional models as available in the CMIP-6 archive. Thank you. Question nine, among GCMs, RCMs, Cordexes, which one is the best for impact modeling that we include all those models in an ensemble to produce robust scenarios? So again, here, I don't want to select for you. Um, I think the, the training here has empowered you to, to ask some questions depending on your own motivations and resources and other things in that uh, decision-making process. Um, but I will make some, some notes on this. Um, we, we have talked several times about the danger of using uh, direct climate model outputs without any bias adjustment. That can lead to uh, biases, especially for impact situations where there is a a true biophysical or engineering tolerance threshold of some sort, um, having a bias where, where the model is always a degree or two too warm or maybe 10% too wet or dry. Um, it's not enough just that it captures changes correctly. If, if those numbers are biased, you can have problems with uh, crop productivity or flood level uh, damages and things like that. Um, so bias adjustment is important. Uh, in, in the downscaling, you, the, the questioner mentions two different forms of the, of the same approach, RCMs being regional climate models, which are the fundamental uh, components of Cordex. Um, so, you know, there are applications, as we've noted, where there is fine resolution topography or coastlines or land use changes that would suggest that some kind of downscaling is important. Uh, that's something that you have to weigh against the data needs and, and overall resourcing of the project. Question 10, CMIP-6 can provide 10 kilometer resolution across the globe, but we might need one kilometer resolution for impact models at the watershed basin level. Which downscaling methods are most appropriate for that purpose? So first of all, CMIP-6, um, direct normal CMIP-6 simulations don't get down to 10 kilometers. Most of them are, are closer to a, a one degree or more like a 100 kilometer spatial resolution. Um, some of the high-res MIP simulations might get down closer to 10 kilometers, but in general, if you're looking at 10 kilometers or even one kilometer, you're, you're going to want some kind of a downscaling approach. Um, here is where, again, we have to put extra caution. Uh, just to note that 10 kilometers is a quite fine resolution for a lot of the climate information that we have. Um, the observational products that are down at 10 kilometers and even more so at one kilometer uh, have to be considered. And the fact that there are observational data sets with one kilometer resolution does not mean that they have been quality controlled and checked uh, to, to validate each one of those one kilometers. 
Uh, so be cautious about the potential that you might introduce bias by chasing higher resolution. Um, and, and again, determine whether your region really merits that type of, of fine scale features. Um, and likewise, if your application merits that level of fine scale features. So watershed based in scales, I can understand why you would want that level of, of detail, um, but be cautious that you, you don't uh, chase resolution just for the sake of resolution and, and, and miss out on, on potential biases you could be introducing there. Great, question 11. What does global 0.5 degree domain mean in EasyMIP? I don't quite understand what it's used for. And um, all right, so yeah, and then I see how do you, how do you access the data? Um, so the EasyMIP data, what I meant to say there is that this is a global domain, so you can find information for any part of the world, and it is at a half degree grid cell, so you can find a, a different time series of data for every half degree of the of the world, uh, which is about a 50 kilometer uh, resolution in the end. And uh, we've provided a link there that uh, Brock will hopefully uh, put into the uh, chat box or somewhere else that you can get to it um, in terms of where you can get the EasyMIP data. And just please note when you go to the EasyMIP data, they have climate information and they have impact information. So make sure you know what you're getting. Great, thank you. And I did post that into the chat and um, that will also be available on the Q&A document PDF when we post that to the web page for you to use as a reference. Uh, question 12, are there any reference data of 30 meter resolution, temperature and precipitation? Possibly other yeah. variables. So this this is like question ten above. Um, I, I noted how difficult it is to get to one kilometer. Thirty meter is even finer resolution. Um, this is something that you know with computational power. You know I myself have run crop models at very fine resolution, but usually in in the historical period, uh, going out into the future, it's a a big challenge. Um, to get information at a 30 meter resolution, it's it's difficult to justify that considering the observational capabilities in most parts of the world. Um, so yeah, check check out what I said above to, to question 10, um, and be careful chasing high resolution uh, and and the biases that you might introduce in that process. Great, thanks. We we try to combine similar questions in the same ones. You don't have to answer it twice, but um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, question 13. Can we use reanalysis data as observation data and check the, if the projections are reasonable? Yeah, so I'll I'll say uh, for those who don't know, reanalyses are, are retrospective analyses. They are, are efforts to to assimilate uh, a huge number of observations into uh, physically consistent weather models, uh, typically numerical weather prediction and and other types of climate information models. Um, so those can be very useful and are especially appealing in places where the local observations are not as strong uh, and you need some kind of information to fill in the gaps between observations. Um, Reanalyses are, are typically fairly coarse in resolution, so there's a challenge with that. Um, and they do have their own biases. In many cases, people bias adjust reanalyses even further. Uh, the reason you have to, re you have to do uh, bias adjustment is because for many of the impacts relevant variables, the reanalyses do not directly assimilate observations. So they may assimilate the, the temperature profile of the lower atmosphere, but not the actual two meter temperature uh, that, that would affect crops, for example. Uh, and most reanalyses do not directly assimilate precipitation. Uh, the, the resulting precipitation flux comes from the physical parameters of the model as it runs forward in time. Um, so that means there are known biases in reanalysis. Um, and that has to be considered in this process. But again, when you're in a situation where you have no local observations, uh, in many cases, the reanalysis has less bias than the, the global model itself would. And in that sense, the reanalysis may be appealing to reduce that bias. Question 14, referring to your paper. Mm -hmm. um, is this showing the bias using one model or adaptation method if the area is more hot or cold? Could you give another example of model democracy problem? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question, but but to what I understand, um, what you're seeing in, in that, that set of uh, projections that I showed for the Ames, Iowa location, where I identified in the red triangles, the, the hot and dry models, um, that was not so much bias as much as uncertainty across the model projections. So different 
climate models give slightly different projections because of all of their internal physics and other things that, that make models different. Um, so when trying to decide how to carry forward a smaller set of climate model projections because of the resource constraints of other parts of the project, um, we wanted to select representative models uh, so that the major storylines of change could be understood by stakeholders. Um, so we, we made sure we looked at a, a hotter and drier scenario, uh, hotter and wetter, um, the relatively cool, but of course still warm scenarios um, as well. And when we looked at the resulting agricultural impacts across those, the stakeholders were able to determine what types of adaptations they would want to prioritize against the, the worst case scenarios and against the so-called best case scenarios. Um, so it was instructive to use those representative model projections um, and, and then keep track of how many models were similar to each one of those storylines. So we were able to say, not just that it was hot and dry scenario uh, that we were examining, but how many other projections were similar to that. And in that sense, we can kind of keep some information about the overall set of models, even as we're, we're selecting a, a, a smaller set to conduct forward. Um, I guess in terms of another example of the model democracy problem, um, as we're looking at these, these uh, so-called hot model issues, um, when we do some projections, for example, looking at, at climate impacts on NASA facilities, um, we are, are in, in many cases using only the models that fall within the, uh, the very likely range as assessed by the IPCC. Um, and that's something, again, if, if there is uh, enough resources and enough capacity to explain and understand all of these, these subtle differences between these model projections, uh, in general, it makes sense to, to cast a wide net and look at all these projections. But as you start communicating and as you start limiting uh, resources, uh, these decisions have to be made. Thank you. Question 15, it's more of an elaboration uh, request on uh, storylines, given different meanings depending on the target audience or stakeholders. Yeah, so storylines is a pretty broad category here. I, I think that the intent of us talking about it is to say that there are these benchmark famous scenarios like the, the SSP RCPs that, that have been determined. Um, but that is not the end of the discussion that, that stakeholders may be interested in a specific storyline that does not already exist in one of these you know, high tier uh, you know, CMIP scenarios. And in that sense, there may be cause to create additional projection sets you know, coming straight from model outputs or, or utilizing some kind of uh, filter to, to focus on particularly interesting events or subsets of the model, um, that, that is the type of thing that, that might help stakeholders more appropriately target uh, towards the type of situations that they're concerned about. And again, I would, would say that if you are selecting a storyline, it's, it's worth keeping uh, an eye on on likelihoods or or the types of caveats or assumptions that go into that storyline um, so that it can be contextualized in, in the overall decision making process. Thank you very much. Question 16 regarding a general overview of the possible climate changes. If I want to reduce my data set sample size by selecting only one ensemble per model, which considerations would one want to keep in mind in this selection process? So I think uh, I'm going to venture to guess that there's a word missing here, which is I think they mean selecting only one ensemble member uh, per model. Uh, so many times when people maybe put it in brackets or something, because I don't mean to put words in, in their mouth. Um, the the uh, when, when climate modelers run simulations, they may run multiple iterations of the same model in the same scenario with slightly different initial conditions, which effectively create slightly different model uh, instances of internal variability, let's say. Um, so in many cases, there is a smaller group of the ensemble members that are submitted to the, the online archives like CMIP6, and maybe an even smaller set that is submitted with all of the, the sub-monthly or even sub-daily types of outputs. So in some cases, this decision has already been made in terms of uh, what's available, or I should say it's been made for you in terms of the availability of the data. Uh, if you want more than that, you'd have to contact the modeling groups. And in most cases, if you want to get one of these off the shelf, um, pre-bias adjusted data sets, you, you know, you're going to be quite limited in, 
in the ensemble member choices. Um, now that said, there's a lot of literature out there that talks about the uncertainty in the internal variability compared to the signal of climate change in the long run and how you might deal with that. But it's one of the reasons that it's important not to, to confuse a projection for a prediction. Um, one ensemble member may put a drought in the year 2070. Uh, the next ensemble member might not have a drought in the year 2070. That's the internal variability that you don't want to get too caught up on. Uh, it would be more interesting to look at the distribution of events and what it says about how climate change is affecting uh, the overall patterns. Um, so I'd encourage, if you have an interest in that internal variability versus uh, long-term climate change, you might seek out one of the large ensemble projects, which has provided many, many ensemble members, uh, or look into the literature on, on the broader set of signals and noise type issues. Great, thank you. Question seven, for the models you presented, are they open to the public, non-commercial, which I think we pretty much addressed before, uh, and next GDP PMIP sits, what are the positives of negatives of using this data set? Uh, so on the first question, the, the models are, are largely available. We did talk about data licensing because some, some projection sets have restrictions, um, so I, I can't answer uniformly. Um, but the CMIP6 models were created in, in a, in, as a public good, so there's a, a lot of that output is freely available. And uh, projects like EasyMIP and AgMIP and others have, have made uh, their, their models uh, and, and projections available. Um, the, the next data set and, um, and the LOCA data set and some of those other data sets, uh, again, are, are publicly available. Uh, in terms of the positives and negatives of, of GDDP from NEXT, um, I would refer you back to the slide in the, in the presentation in terms of the key characteristics that, that make that data set what it is. Um, just off the top of my head, it stands out as having many climate models available um, and having a, a bias adjustment um, that, that includes some of the key variables that, that would be needed for things like crop modeling. Thank you. Question 18, and we have time for a couple more. I, I know there are more than we can get to, but we'll do our best. Question 18, during my research using core data datasets and calculating indices using ClimPact, it took largely the memory storage processing power a long time. Could you please recommend any way that I can improve on handling data storage, et cetera? Yeah, so this is one of the issues that comes with, with using downscale data. It, it starts to just be a lot of information and a lot of, of space that are that's needed. Um, so I, I I think I can I can I can recognize that as an issue here and say that if you want to use the finer resolution data or if you want to have many ensemble members and many GCMs and, and GCM scenario RCM combinations all of those things, it's going to run up the computational resources needed. Um, there are some groups uh, that have cloud-based computational approaches. Uh, that would allow you to process data without having to download it all. Uh, that timing uh, can be can be an issue, um, and uh, that might be sped up if it's done on a high performance computer. You can sometimes do that in parallel processing. Uh, not everybody has access to those types of things, so uh, in some cases it might be worth um, you know getting in touch with the communities to see if these analyses have already been done. So you don't have to reinvent that wheel. You don't have to do the process over again if somebody has already done it. Um, so I think I think there is a this would be something that could be of, of interest in a follow on survey. If, if this is an identified problem, uh, it could could be an indication that more cloud type uh, activities would be useful. Uh, and. I think Alex may have frozen there. So let me, and you know, we're actually coming to the, the end of the hour. So I apologize if we didn't get to um, the rest of the questions live and we'll do our best to address those before we post this. But I do wanna mention that this is part two, the last part of this training series. There is no homework associated with this training. Um, so basically, if you want to get a certificate of completion, you had to have uh, attended both live, live trainings. 
So uh, if you did, you will see a certificate of completion in your inbox within the next three months. It takes a little bit of time to process all those. We had about eight to 900 people from around the globe joining us. So I hope that you felt like you were part of the uh, projections in climate change community by attending this and um, uh, seeing all the other people from around the globe interested in the very same thing. Uh, varying degrees of expertise, um, some just getting into it, some people that are really into it, but we hope that this kind of put all of us uh, a little bit more on the same page as we go forward as a community. Please look for this training to uh, be posted. Part one is already on the training webpage. Part two will be there probably by tomorrow for you to use as a reference and it will always live there. So uh, please, you can re uh, reference it at any time. With that, it looks like Alex is not back. I wanted to give him no. a chance. Oh, there you are. Okay, I wanted to give you a chance for some back. Yeah. I know we're at the end of our time here. Um, hopefully you heard the, the, the end to that Cortex question. Uh, I saw that there was one question in Spanish. I'd love to get to that question uh, before we, we call it quits. Let's do it. Let me find it. There we are. Okay. Uh, so the easy model involves multiple sectors, several scenarios, 11 variables, and it gives the impression that is the most complete. Is that true? And I think it is free to use. So uh, the answer is that it's free to use, but the easy community usually wants to know who is using it. Um, this is something that you'll find in many cases that when people make these projection sets available, uh, it's common courtesy mm -hmm. and very useful to get in touch with the, pro the projection set owners and let them know that you want to use it. Um, that way they can help link different projects together. For example, if you're doing a crop modeling study, uh, I'm, I'm involved in, in uh, EasyMIP and AgMIP collaborations on crop modeling. Uh, so we would love to know if you're using that because then we can compare your results with, with what we might get from other approaches and that, that improves the entire community. Um, so the, so the, they are freely available. Uh, I would not say that it is necessarily the most complete or it's the, the you know, the best or anything like that. Um, what I would say is that the EasyMIP data set is something that has been designed to allow a lot of impact modeling on top of that. Uh, it tends to be somewhat coarser in resolution than you might find in other uh, projection sets. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, the best in all parts of the world for all applications. Uh, but if you are interested in your results, linking with other impact modelers uh, and potentially setting up a situation where you can compare what happens in your sector with what happens in other sectors. For example, understanding from a water resources perspective how irrigation might change so that you can compare those results to an agricultural perspective on how irrigation might change. Easy Map facilitates that type of process, but it's not the only one doing that. The, the US National Climate Assessment recently used the, the LOCA data uh, and set up a similar circumstance where you could compare across multiple sectors. Um, so there's you know, again, depending on your domain uh, and depending on the application in mind, you might be drawn to one or more of those. Great, thank you. I'm glad we got that last one in. Um, is there any parting words you'd like to put out there before we uh, close the training today? Um, I just wanted to once again acknowledge my collaborator, Maridel Phillips, who helped uh, put this all together and thank the RSEC team for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about all of these important concepts. Uh, I know that uh, we didn't give you one answer in the end of this. I, I hope that the characteristics that we've provided and the, the core questions and warnings uh, and advantages of different approaches uh, have, have been communicated to the best of, of what we can do. And uh, I would encourage all of you uh, the, to, to pursue these types of climate applications. It's a very important topic uh, considering all the changes going on in the world. And in general, you know, wearing my hat as the climate impacts group uh, at NASA GIS, we are always interested in applications that are happening in different parts of the world um, so that we can connect and also understand what type of NASA observations or products would better support those types of, of applications down the road. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing all the great work that comes out of this group. Great, thank you so much for your time on this training. It was very valuable. We're happy to have you, Alex. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we are just ramping up our climate themed trainings. 
look for three of them per year. So uh, stay tuned if this is uh, something you care and are working to uh, solve. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your days, everybody.